And welcome back to the Sabbatarianism podcast, a podcast for Sabbatarians by Sabbatarians. My name is Justin. I am the host. I have back with me Mr. Richard Davis this afternoon. Hello, Richard. Hello, Justin. All right. So today we are going to carry on with our verse by verse study of the book of Hebrews. Uh, we left off at the faith chapter, at chapter 11, and that's where we're going to pick back up. But uh, do you want to maybe do a little bit of a recap, kind yeah. of recap what's happened so far in Hebrews, and then we'll we'll pick up f the faith chapter and carry forward? Okay, I think it's important to, to not lose the overall context of the, the letter to the Hebrews. It was written, you know, first he established the superiority of Christ and his followers. Uh, over the angels uh, as far as their destiny is concerned. And then he went into the purpose of this letter to was encourage these Hebrew Christians who had believed in Christ for decades. Decades, Yes, but uh, perhaps were in danger of losing their faith and falling back. And they hadn't striven forward. They hadn't that's right. carried the ball forward, yeah. and he was a little upset with that. Yeah, so in chapter 4, he compared her walk to coming out and to accepting Christ and going forward to the mistake that Israel made in coming out of Egypt and then refusing to go into the rest there, uh, and their bones falling in the wilderness. And he makes that comparison that we also have a rest, and we can— suffer the same fate in this wilderness if we don't remain faithful and carry on our obedience to God. And then from that he goes on to tell them in chapter 5 that they're just still like little children and they haven't grown. From there we went into the differences, or he went into the differences in the Sinai covenant and in this new covenant with Christ and the different types and how we have a, a better Better covenant, which is established on better promises. We have a better system for dealing with sin. Yes. You know, uh, we don't need the sacrificial system anymore. We we have a better high priest than the, the human uh, sons of Aaron ever had been or ever could be. Yes, and it's not something that he adds to that system. You have to go back to the beginning and start over on the right foundation, which is Christ. And not the law, as you know, Paul talked about so often in, t in his letter to the Romans, to put those things in a proper place. And, well, I don't want to rehash it all, but that's where we are now. He's, he's back to, begins to be back to the same, to the initial theme of the letter, which was to admonish them to remain faithful, faithful to what they committed to previously. And like the Romans, don't look to the temple system, don't look to the old sacrificial system, don't look to all those new that's things, right. to look to the new thing because it's better. Yeah, that's better. All right. Anything else you want to cover before we get going here? No, I think that's about it, just to get us in mind of where we are here. Yeah, where he's driving in this letter. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, so here we go. Uh, Hebrews 11. Verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for in our hearts and minds, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained a witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead, still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. That's God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. What does it mean by he is? Just like the I am? Yes, that God is. I mean, you can't... The, the whole theme throughout the scriptures, even from Adam, is that it takes faith. That we must believe and obey. Yeah. Don't try... You know, people want to say... Uh, 
Prove to me there's a God. I don't want to prove anything to you if you don't believe in God. That's what God says. You believe in me first, and then I'll show you. You know, I don't need to prove anything to you. I'm the creator <laughs> of the universe. <laughs> Who are you? And uh, I think that is a fruitless conversation to mess with that kind of stuff with the heart of unbelief. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved to a godly fear, prepared for an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Can I stop you there? Yes. Sarah first laughed yes. at this notion. Yeah. It, it, I, f I find this one a little bit hard to work out in my mind. Well, you know, when God t says, why did you laugh? And she says, I didn't. He said, oh, yes, you did. <laughs> right. <laughs> that probably changed her attitude. Okay. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead, were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So we, you've spoken about this. Yes. You, they, you've spoken about how Abraham knew about, or not knew about, but had faith in in this good thing that was to come. That's right, that had been promised. In fact, that expression from son of man that they look for in Christ, and he called himself that. Right. That was in their his, history and knowledge back from the expression in Genesis and beginning there in chapter 3 and verse 15 where uh, God prophesied to Satan that a son of Eve would bruise his head and he would bruise his heel. So that's what the Son of Man is in reference yes, to? Yes, that's it. Wow. The, the child of Eve that would disrupt and take everything back from Satan. Okay. And, you know, there's evidence of that uh, in Job. Job said, I know that my Redeemer lives, and one day he will stand upon the earth. They look forward to that. And so that's the promises mentioned here in, in verse 13? Yeah, the... the uh, Promise by your seed given to Abraham shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. That one seed. That's the, the promise. son of that promise man Messiah. basically yes. will be uh -huh. the Messiah and will do the work of Genesis 3 that you just yes. spoke of. Yes. Okay. He's going to supplant Satan and put everything back and restore it like it should have been. Back to the order of Melchizedek. Yeah. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland, and it's not on this earth, or it's not about this earth or this physical world. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. So they, they, they weren't looking back. That's right. Like weren't the saying, Israelites. oh, I miss my home. Oh, I miss Egypt where we were fat. And yeah, that's what the Israelites did. And that's why their bones uh, were strewn in the wilderness. But now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham. When he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises, and once again, that's talking about, doesn't mean at that time all that Abraham was promised had been given. It means he's the one that God gave the promises to. Okay. Offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, and Isaac your seed shall be called. 
concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. So that's what gave Abraham the faith. Yes. To what he was, he was going to sacrifice Isaac, but, yeah. but he had faith that God could raise this boy up and still yeah. carry out the promises that he had promised. God had already given him at his age this son yeah. from a, a, a wife long after they were through, or she was past child rearing age, bearing age. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshiped, leaning on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning the bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he looked for the reward. You see, Moses was aware of the promised Redeemer as well. Again, from Genesis 3? Right. Well, the, of Christ. What's calling Christ or the Redeemer, the future Redeemer. The reproach that would come on him through following him, that way and that belief. Better than, he esteemed that better than the riches and all the pleasures of Egypt. By faith, he forsook, forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. By faith the harlot Rahab did not perish for those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. And what more shall I say? For the time shall fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still those had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain by the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, and of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God being, having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. What's that mean? This means they're still waiting. Okay. They know nothing of it. But, you know, we're looking for the resurrection, which is the... I guess from a human perspective of time, it would be a point in time. But the scriptures say that the dead know nothing. Yeah. We will all see Christ at the same time, regardless of when we live. I, th I think it's interesting here. I mean, all these faithful people, and yet they went through some really hard times. I mean, the life of a prophet was rough. Or, or just many just sticking to what they believed, whether they're prophets or not. No you matter know, what came in front of them. Especially in these early times uh, of the Christian church, there were many killed and persecuted and driven out. Yeah. Chapter 12. Yes, sir. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily 
ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that is set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. He's referring there back to that statement in uh, chapter 4 where he said that he, Christ, has entered his rest. He who has entered his rest, Christ, has rested from his labors, and he set the example for us. And he suffered more than all of us. That's right. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You've not yet resisted the bloodshed, striving against sin, and you've forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as the sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? So by that, he's saying you should expect hard times at times, not all the time, but you should, if, if yeah. you do wrong, you are going to get punished by your father. And you well, should you expect, should be. You yeah, should you be. should be. Absolutely. But, but all these other people that he just listed out here had some really rough times, and you should expect that. And really, it's it's kind of a good sign, is it not, that Yes, that it, the Father is working with you when you experience that. That's it's hard for us to well, it to says kind of fathom. It says that Christ learned in that He suffered. Yeah, you know if uh, we never go any through any trials, then how is our faith ever tested? Yeah, how is character ever tested unless we're faced with a test? So when you see somebody else that seems to have everything going right for them the whole time, well, maybe they're not <laughs> yeah. right with God, you know? Or maybe they haven't, you know, there's, you don't know. Yeah, you don't know. You know, the, we have this world where we think we can spoil all our children because we want to let them tell us how to raise them. Mm -hmm. And uh, somehow they're going to end up good. That's a great point. Until life offer, throws them a curveball. Paul says if you love your children, then discipline them. You chasten them and discipline them. Yes. But if you were without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you're illegitimate and not sons. There it is. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, yet he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, on cha now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. He's referring back to the spiritual state they have become. Mm. Uh, once again, you know, not growing over this period of years that they've been in the faith. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance though he sought it diligently with tears. For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and burned with fire and the blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words so that those who heard it begged that the words should not be spoken to them any more, for they could not endure what was commanded. And if so much as a beast touches a mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. 
And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. The assembly of the firstborn, I think is a better word there, who are registered in heaven. To God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Can I I stop you there? Yes. So this whole discourse we just went through here, he's reflecting back to the foot of the mountain. That's exactly what he's doing. Yeah. They pulled back after they initially heard him speak the Ten Commandments directly to them. And then they pulled back and changed everything in the relationship they shared with him. And Moses said he was exceedingly he was afraid. afraid and trembling, but yet he didn't pull back. No, right? That's right. He, we're told, he overcame it with courage. Yeah, we're told back faith. there that he, uh, that he told them, he's trying you to see if you have faith in him. And they said, no, we're not going up there to him anymore. And that's where the mediator system came from. And that was the initial sin that caused the disparity, uh, the separation between God and the people. We're told that in Jeremiah 7. They went backwards. Everything went downhill from there. Yes. And 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 it was like it was rotting them. Uh, I'd also like to discuss verse 24 here. Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of the sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Yeah. I've, I've missed that for many years. I mean, it's like I'm reading it for the first time here, even though I've read it several times. He's speaking, the Abel's blood cried out for vengeance for what happened for what cain did to him right that's what is being spoken of to jesus the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks or promises better things and i've taken that to mean than what abel do you know it begins this in chapter 11 talking talking about abel was faithful Mm -hmm. but it wasn't about eternal life he was just faithful in obeying the rules that God set before him of the law and making a blood sacrifice, which was important, rather than a sacrifice of grain, which was contrary to what you know God commands. And what we have in Christ, the blood, his blood, gives us something better than what Abel was looking forward to. Okay. When I read it, I, I just took it as, you know, Abel's... Blood was crying out for vengeance for what had happened to him, and and the blood that Meshach, that Messiah shed was not crying out for vengeance against those he said, "Father, forgive them." It's a better word coming from this blood versus Abel's blood. Well, that may be. Okay. You know, sometimes there are different meanings they're trying to get across, but the the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling of the new covenant. Which is a reference to the sprinkling in, in a, the Day of Atonement, right? Well, it's a reference to the sprinkling of Christ's blood before presentation of his blood before the altar in heaven. Mm. When he went up there, as he we were told back, I think, in chapter 9, when that blood replaces the sprinkling of the animal's blood. Right. Like right. Abel, Abel sacrificed and like was given there in, Chapter 23 of Exodus, once they had refused the covenant in the pure form that God had all, had offered them. And that blood of sprinkling on that of animal blood was not about the, sacri- the forgiveness of sin and eternal life. Okay. It was about being lawfully ordered in order. Doing what you're told. Doing what you're told under that covenant be, to be in right standing under that covenant. But it was about inheriting the promised land and living in peace in that society and having the blessings that were required. So was it a shadow of this better thing that was yes. to come? Yes, it was a shadow. Okay. But that covenant was based upon the, a, the covenant that God made with Abraham in Genesis 15 when he passed through the halves. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he said that, 
Abraham's children would go into that land when the sins of the Canaanites had become full. Full, yeah. And drive them out and fulfill that purpose and be a holy nation to God. Now, that wasn't eternal life. It was just a fulfillment of that promise that you would go into this land of milk and honey. Yeah, that was part of the promise that had been given to Abraham. Yeah, one of, maybe one yes. of the promises. Yes. Yeah, but it wasn't about eternal life as it turned out. Now, you can say when he originally, there in chapter 19 of Exodus, when he originally came before them, they accepted his the, the covenant he offered. Then he gave them the Ten Commandments. It had the... The hope from that point of being so, but once they pulled away from him, it was lost. Okay. And that's what he's telling us here. We have a better hope for a better covenant. It's not about the land of of uh, Israel or Canaan and all these physical blessings we can have. We're talking about the other promise We're talking where about his seed would life. bless the whole world that's right. with eternal life. That's right. Okay. And he says, don't pull away from him. And lack, lose faith. And have the same thing happen to you that happened, happened to, them to them at the foot of the mountain. Yes, this refers right back to fourth chapter of Hebrews. Okay. We went through that. All right, thank you. I appreciate it. We uh, we left off there at 24. Okay, we're on, we're on verse... 25. 25. Yep. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him when he spoke on earth, and that's when we're talking about. Yeah. Foot of the mountain. Said, come, they escaped come to him, me. And they said, no, give us a mediator. Yeah. Much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he has promised saying, yet once more I shall shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this yet once more indicates a removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably without rever with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. So that mistake uh, that they made there was the root of all the problems that came in afterward it was the foundation of the problems yeah, and they're, he's saying don't make that same mistake yeah, they resect they, they refused to believe they lost faith they rejected his holy spirit in them personally though his spirit was with them guiding it, and guiding yeah. in various ways and lost out and he's saying don't follow their example because it, you know, if we, they rejected that, how much more how much will it more, be bad for you yes. rejecting this better thing? Yes. Yeah. Let brotherly love continue. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some have unwittingly entertained angels. I, I, that's a really important one to me. I, I brought it up when we studied this here uh, in our in our weekly studies. Is angels are among us as people. Yeah. They look just like people, but they're among us. That's what this verse is saying. Yeah. You might mistake a person that is actually an angel doing work for God. So right. keep that in mind when you're dealing with people, right? Yeah. And angels, that means the word there means messenger. messenger. Yeah. And there are times that people can be messengers from God, and God can send people to you to see how you respond. Yes. Test you. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourself are in the body also. He's talking there, I, I think, about those Christians who had been imprisoned because of their faith and their, their belief. And, you know, we should also, if we have people that we know that are being imprisoned, offer the correct kind of support to them where it can be fruitful and good for them. Yeah, and he closes this out by saying, I don't want to get to the end here, but those from Italy greet you. Well, when he, if, if this is Paul in Italy, when he was in Italy, he was in jail, yeah, correct? right. So he himself was a prisoner. Was a prisoner. Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled. 
but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Let your conduct be without courteousness. Covetousness. Co- yeah, covetousness, yes. Be content with such things as you, as you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow concerning the outcome of their conduct. Specifically, I think there he's talking about the apostles. Yeah. Because they had been given the rule of the authority. They weren't authoritarian rulers of the church because Christ had forbid them and told them not not to. Well, but I think- they did have the authority over establishing the foundation of the faith in the New Testament church. That was their sphere of authority. Remember those who lead you mm-hmm. might be a better way. You know, yeah, the, the leaders of Official the leadership. Yeah. yeah. Those, but it's, it's, but it's, it's saying those who have spoken the word of God to you initially brought it right. to you, whose faith followed. And, of course, that would go for anybody in your group that is supposed to have responsibilities. You know, someone is in charge of something, don't argue and fuss and fight and reject it. Have proper order. But that's not authoritarian rulership. Right, which there should not be. The only authoritarian over your life should be God. Jesus Christ, yeah. yes. So I, I think this part about covetousness, something has really hit me lately about covetousness. When when we say, oh, if I had a better wife or if I had a better car or a better house, we're we're slapping God in the face for what he has given us, the wife he has given us, the house he has given us. We're telling him, well, that's just not good enough. I want something better than what you've done for me. Well, this greed of never having enough. Yeah. It's just a... It's awful. I mean, it's a bottomless pit. Yep. You know, like I've, I've told young people, told my children, you know, if you want a house, buy a house that you'll stay with and keep and pay for it. And if you just keep have, wanting a bigger, better thing, you'll never have anything. It's up to a bunch of debt and a bunch of misery and a bunch of unhappiness. And uh, if you're married, be content with your husband, your wife. Learn to love each other. Draw close to Christ because there is no bigger, better thing out there. It's just yeah. another headache. <laughs> and it's uh, it's a lack of being thankful for what God gives you. Right. Yes. God gave you that husband or that wife. Be grateful for that. And covetousness is being unthankful. Yes. It exactly. really is. Yep. Okay. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines, for it's good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. And there again, we have how many things do people make a foundation of of their so-called religious group to argue with somebody else about? The secret doctrine. I yeah, know something I you know don't something. know. Yeah, therefore, I am. No, yeah. you're not. Yeah. Yeah, it's, there's no end to it. Yep. Yeah. For it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods, which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. That's talking about the Levites. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. You know, our, our future is not in this world or in this organization or in this society. That's what he's it's really saying. It's outside said. the camp. That's right. That's outside the camp. So you, you got to go outside of the established order in order to re, of man. Mm-hmm. To really know God the way he wants you to. And that's what he's referring to here with all the outside the camp. outside. Yeah. The, yeah. So um, I'm going to try to remember to link to 
uh, a sermon that a friend of yours gave or message that a friend of yours, Jim Rector, who's who's passed away, mm -hmm. uh, called outside the camp. I'm going to I'm going to link to that. I can't download it and then offer it to people. That's their property. But I will uh, try to remember to put in a link to this particular sermon called Outside the Camp. Uh, we listened to it at the feast this this past year, and it's absolutely excellent. I've probably yes. listened to it four or five times. I, I yes. just think it's one of the best messages I've I've heard. He speaks so well. Um, so look for that in in the show notes. Okay, verse fifteen. Therefore, by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. But do not forget to do good and to share. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Obey those who rule over. That word, I think, in the, in the Greek refers to one who has official leadership. Yeah. And be submissive that they watch out for your, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. And that begins with who? Children so, obeying your parents. Okay. Wives submit to your husbands. And submit yourself to the Messiah. Yeah, husbands. Yeah. The head of the of the the husband is Christ, and the head of Christ is God. Now that's true order, yeah, of God's government, so so to speak. Boy, and, it's been mixed up in today's society. Yeah, and then the uh, the church organization or the body—I wouldn't say organization, but within the assembly, where you have certain people that have been given a charge or responsibility by respect to the group. Uh, if they're leading in some manner, follow the lead. Yeah, like here. Don't argue with them. Yeah, here Neil takes care of all the repairs and maintenance here, you know, and if he needs help, we help him. Do we what don't he come says. in and say, we don't argue Neil, I think <laughs> you should do it like this. He's been given yeah. that responsibility. That's Just right. help him. That's right. It's talking about co cooperative and, be and submission. But here it's talking about those who watch out for your souls, and that begins with your parents. Yeah. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Pray for us that we are confident that we have a good conscience, for we are confident that we have a good conscience and all things desiring to live honorably. But I especially urge you to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant make you complete in every good word to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And I appeal to you, brethren, bear with the word of exhortation, that for I have written to you in few words, knowing that our brother Timothy has been set free, with whom I shall see you if he comes shortly, greet all those who rule over you and all the saints, those from Italy greet you. Grace be with you all. Amen. Yeah, there's a reference to Timothy. Um, verse 19, but I especially urge you to do this, that I, I may be restored to you the sooner. Yes. So whomever wrote this letter and was and in prison, <laughs> was in prison. And they whoever received this letter knew who was writing it. Yeah. He didn't feel the need to address. Yes. Address that here. So, yeah, I, I think especially with this Timothy part here at the end, this has just got to be Paul's writing. Yes. Well, it bears all the trademarks, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. It's a great letter. Yeah. This is almost like the Bible within the Bible here. Um, yes. This is a great It lesson. really lays out a lot of understanding and answers a lot of questions that people continually contend with about the covenants, the, what's done away, what's not done away. It's, uh, you know, the, the thing I, I would stress is this text here beginning in verse 18 of chapter 12. We're, here, we're admonished. We're coming before the throne of God in heaven and not to make that mistake of demanding a mediator or allowing anyone to serve as a mediator to get between you and God is so important. It tells us, well, this whole book does, way back from the beginning of the first couple of chapters, 
where it tells us everything is founded on Christ. This is not something that's added to or altered. It's not the new, the old covenant or the Sinai covenant with some alterations, like preachers and or ministers instead of Levitical priests and all that other stuff. It's about going back to God at that moment at the foot of the mountain and starting over in the right way, and learning to know Him the way our God and Father, the way our Father Abraham did. And it's available to all people, not That's just right. a, a special seed or, or something mm -hmm. like that. It's available yeah. to all people. And these people literally had to come outside the former established order, outside that camp, in order to learn that. And it was a struggle. I mean, yes. everything we've read here in the New Testament speaks of this struggle to get them outside of that camp. Yeah. And, and, and how... There were people from within side that camp trying to drag them in, you know, and, back and into trick it. them into yeah. coming back into that camp. You've known people, I'm sure, who mm -hmm. would tell you, well, it's the same law as, as the law of Moses, except for this and that and that. Well, you know, <laughs> no, it's not. It's how God's laws would have been applied had they not demanded Moses and obeyed God face to face and come up to him the way they were admonished. And had a close personal relationship with him. That's it. And now the Holy Spirit is there. Changing Messiah the man. is the mediator, not some man. Or some organization. Right. It's, it's all been righted. That's right. All right. Well, um, I think we should probably leave off here. We're at about 40 minutes. Uh, anything else you want to offer here or recap? No, I don't. I it's, think we recapped it pretty good. Yeah, I think so. It's We can cut it here and we'll start on another subject next time. We don't really have time to do anything else justice. Yeah. Maybe Philemon. Or <laughs> Is it Philemon? Philemon. <laughs> Maybe that one, but uh, oh, well. I, th I think we'll just go ahead and leave it off here, and we'll pick up next week with something else. Okay. Thank you, Richard. You bet. All right. Bye-bye.